I would like to make a motion to return back to our session. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Stanton. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? And we are back in public session at 634. And at this time, we'd like to go to our presentations and discussions. And our first presentation is the Class of 2024 Outcome Data. Yes, today we're going to present the 2024 outcome data like we do annually. Great information. We're also going to present the WIDA scores by Dr. Crystal Marr and our NJGPA assessment scores. Maybe not necessarily in that order, but that's what you'll see next. This is not better? Okay. All right. Um, so we're going to begin with um, a testing result. We have a requirement that within 60 days of when um, assessments come in, we have to report out to the public. So we're going to begin with our WIDA access results, which is an assessment taken by our multilingual learners in grades K through 12. It's given annually to monitor, mo excuse me, monitor students' progress in learning in academic English. So it really takes a look at the English acquisition process. It meets our US federal requirements for the Every Student Succeeds Act uh, for monitoring and reporting English language learners, that's that ELL -L acronym that you see, their progress towards English language proficiency. It's anchored in standards that we call the WIDA English Language Development Standards, which look at the process in several different areas. Um, the four domains of listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And then it also measures students in oral language, literacy, as well as comprehension. The assessment is given on a six-point scale, and students are required to get a 4.5 to exit the program. And this is a um, one indicator that is in addition to teacher feedback. So it's multiple indicators for students to exit the program and to remove the supports that come with being in the English as a Second Language program. Uh, additionally, students are monitored for two years after they exit in case additional supports are needed after it um, in their general education setting. So as I said, it really looks at listening, speaking, reading, and writing. The listening domain measures how well students can understand spoken English. Speaking assesses students' ability to communicate verbally in English, including their fluency and pronunciation. The reading portion uh, evaluates students' ability to comprehend written texts including their skills in identifying things like main idea, details, and inferences. And then writing looks at how well students can produce written English, aspects like grammar, vocabulary, coherence, and organization. Additionally, we look at oral language and literacy. So oral language encompasses both listening and speaking skills. It really looks at the broad abilities to understand and use spoken language, including vocabulary, syntax, and the ability to process and produce speech in real time. So it's really looking at input and output, both in oral language as well as literacy. So similarly, literacy looks at reading and writing and looks at students' ability to understand, interpret, and use written language effectively. These are the results of our WIDA access scores for the 23-24 school year. And as you can see, the scale is broken down into the domains that I said before, listening, speaking, reading, writing, oral language, literacy, comprehension, and then an overall score. And it is that overall score where students are required to get a 4.5 to exit. This graph shows the percentage of students that are in the different categories. So entering and emerging, the aqua color is one to two. Developing, developing and expanding is three to four, and then bridging and reteaching is five to six. And as you see, the majority of our students, listening comes first, so you'll see that gray bar being very high. That's one of the first skills that's developed in English language acquisition. And then you will see that the, in the overall piece, we have some of our students that are bridging and reteaching. The majority of the students that are in program currently are at the developing and expanding stage. 
with some entering and emerging. One of the things about our multilingual learner population is that students, it's a very flexible student group. Students come and they go in all grade levels and they're in for different years, so it's very hard to measure year over year. So percentage is the way that we look at it. For the 23-24 school year, we had 28 students exit our programming, which was 16% of our overall student population, which really speaks to the dedication and the hard work of our teachers, um, both our teachers who focus on multilingual learners and our teachers who are general education um, and have them in the mainstream classes. All right, and that's it for we to access. I'm going to turn it over to Laura Kaplan. Any questions on access scores before I go from our board members? All right, thank you. How are you? I'm Laura Kaplan, Director of School Counseling. Um, I'm going to present, um, as Dr. Marr had said, we're required to report out um, within 60 days of receiving um, test scores, including the New Jersey Graduation Proficiency Assessment. Uh, this is a test that is given annually to our junior class. So our current um, rising seniors, the class of 2025, they took this in the spring of their junior year. And they're tested in English language arts and math. Um, they need to receive a passing score of 725 in each of the two areas to demonstrate proficiency. And what they're tested on is the content that is aligned to the New Jersey standards in their grade 10 ELA algebra one and geometry classes. The way that students are scored are either at the performance level of graduation ready or not yet graduation ready. Uh, the state of New Jersey requires that students fulfill a testing graduation requirement. And as of right now, this is uh, the current first pathway towards demonstrating uh, that requirement. In order to access the second or third pathway, students must sit um, for this test in their junior year. If they do not meet proficiency in one or either area, in ELA or math, then they can fulfill the graduation requirement through a second or third pathway. The second pathway includes predetermined cutoff scores by the state in um, other standardized tests like um, the ACT or SAT, PSAT, and um, the third pathway would be a portfolio appeal. And so um, we, all of our students have, I can, I can say from my time here, we've never had a student not graduate because of they have not met their graduation requirement through one of the three pathways. When we look at um, the class of 2025 in ELA performance, we had 293 valid scores. So you can see in that first line, it demonstrates the state average, and then below that is Summit High School. So you can see that we are um, significantly exceeding the percent of graduation ready overall. And then if you look, um, it's broken down by different demographic information, female, male, students who are economically disadvantaged, and that's defined by um, their free and reduced lunch status, students who have an IEP, students who have a 504 accommodation plan, and then our English language learners. Um, so you can see um, in that line specifically, we would expect those types of scores, um, given that kind of what Dr. Marr just went over, they're still learning the language. When we look at math, we had 294 valid test takers. Um, our scores are slightly lower in terms of percent and grad ready in each area, but still well exceed the state average and pretty consistent overall in terms of how each subgroup um, performed in the ELA versus math. Any questions on NJGPA? And as of right now, this is still um, the first pathway for the class of 2026. Okay, so I'm gonna, can I segue? Yep, okay, I'm gonna stay. So, <laughs> um, I'm also here tonight to present on our class of 2024, our most recent graduates, and the outcome data. So this is a presentation that we do annually. Um, I usually have my uh, counterpart, Allison Grill, our college counselor, she could not be here tonight, um, but I do wanna acknowledge the work that she puts in, not only to supporting our students, but into helping prepare this presentation. Uh, so tonight I'm gonna cover um, overall statistics about where our students uh, are, are going, where they applied, different breakdowns of those statistics in terms of early decision, different demographics, um, where our students are going, different trends and shifts that we've seen overall in this landscape, and finally a, an overall picture of where everybody's going. So for the class of 2024, we had 286 graduates. Um, 
Of that, our four-year college percentage was 87.8, which is up from last year. And our two-year um, attendance is staying steady, um, right around 6%. Overall, the rate of students who are going to two or four year college is our highest um, at 94% uh, that it's been in several years. If you take into account uh, the students who are reflected up here in the post-grad year and gap year, those three students are intending to pursue two or four year after their programs, so that number is even higher. Um, we do have one student who is pursuing a college pep prep program. Um, the intention behind that is to increase potential athletic opportunities at the college level. In terms of our students who are attending a gap year, one is backpacking through Tanzania. How could you pass that up? Um, and then is um, intending to attend McGill University in Canada. And then another is planning on working um, before pursuing their education. In terms of career education, our students are pursuing the industries of construction, automotive. And then we also have students who are um, in our merits program, so the students who continue here in the 18 to 21 year old program are also captured there. Um, for employment, students are um, going into retail and food services. We have no students going to the military and four who are unknown. Um, just to give some context, in terms of the, all of this data is captured, not only in what we receive, how students are applying to school and the results that we get, but also every student completes a senior survey. It's a mandatory checkout requirement before they graduate. So um, they're also indicating their plans in that as well. When we break it down um, a, little, a little bit further, most of our students are pursuing private and public out of state schools. This is consistent year over year. Um, we like to highlight that New Jersey, one of our biggest exports is college students. And so it makes sense that they are leaving the state um, and it doesn't, take far to leave this to to actually get out of state so being in the northeast you could drive um, you know an hour half hour 45 minutes from summit and and be in another state and so that also contributes there's so many opportunities where you don't have to get on a plane and go across the country to access a college out of state we have three students who are studying abroad two in the uk and um, one in the netherlands um, we talked about also the student who is intending to go to mcgill in canada after her, their gap year um, what we see for our students who do pursue those international institutions is that they are very um, focused in terms of industry. So students who really know what they want to do, they can get in and, and pursue a professional degree in a three-year program. Um, so it's, it's really for those students that are, have that focused interest. Um, this spring, we also had done a international admissions panel uh, virtually with schools from the UK and Canada um, and different programs to kind of also help expose our kids to some institutions. We do have a student who's attending the County College of Morris and another student who's attending a county college in Florida that has an agreement where after two years they'll be attending the University of Tampa. Um, for this slide, I just want This is what I just covered. Okay, so in t the outcome broken down by ethnicity. Ethnicity is what is captured from our students when they register in the district. So it's self-reported, and um, that's the data that we are using when we analyze this. Um, some takeaways to highlight here are 82% of our African American students are pursuing post-secondary education. 83% of those that um, identify as Hispanic are pursuing post-secondary, and 90% of those who are multiracial. Um, this year our applications went up, so we are up over 200 applications overall submitted from last year at just over 2,300. This is in part because it was a larger class size, so that makes sense. Um, and also there's been some uncertainty in this landscape where I think kids are, are um, maybe adding one or two more to their, to their list um, to open up their options. Um, that, in terms of that compared to the number of students who submitted an application, we're looking at just over an average of eight applications per student. What you can see here is um, who's getting the most of our applications. And so the red is, is a decrease from last year and the green um, obviously is that increase. Rutgers is still the most popular. Obviously it's our in-state. What you will notice on here though is that Rutgers Newark and Rutgers Camden 
saw pretty meaningful increases, and that's because Rutgers went to the Common App, so it's our universal application, um, and so students were able to click and submit to not just Rutgers New Brunswick, but also submit to be considered for all three campuses. So we think that that's what contributed to those increases there. Um, we saw a big increase in Maryland. Maryland had a rough couple of years of getting a bad rep for low admissions, and so um, we're seeing those numbers go back up in terms of students um, applying. Uh, Northeastern is popular. Uh, they don't have any additional supplemental essays, so if a student did the Common App, they don't have to write an extra essay and they can throw their name in that hat. Um, and so um, we tend to see that as remaining popular. University of Wisconsin, um, what we can attribute that increase to is it's a, it's a big overlap as you can see, our kids like the big public schools out of state. And so it's a big overlap with Michigan, and Michigan is becoming increasingly more competitive and selective, and so students are finding that they're also applying um, there. The continued trends of students applying to more public schools um, than any other type, and the feedback we get is they like that, that the vibe of a big campus, sports, um, school spirit, and those, the private schools tend to be more affordable and have a lot of resources and academic offerings that our students are looking for. In terms of not just where they applied, but where they're going, um, the Union College of New Jersey, they renamed themselves last year, formerly Union County College, um, sees the most because our, of our students who are going to two-year, the overwhelming majority are going there. Um, Ohio State was the hot school this year. Um, we are, we had, um, we're sending 11 students to Ohio State, and so you'll see how that influences the region as well. Wake Forest, um, we had 11 acceptances overall. Eight of those were through early decision. Uh, Wake Forest has a unique application process where they have a rolling early decision. So students um, actually started applying last week. Uh, so it's been busy in the office, um, and they, can, they will admit in a rolling monthly basis. So a lot of our kids who um, like Wake Forest are applying early there, hoping to get a decision and feel, feel done before, sometimes before school even starts. Um, University of Michigan we talked about. Um, what we saw from them is a lot of our students, there was a lot of movement off the wait list. So the wait list is becoming increasingly more popular. And um, we had several students get off the wait list from here. Uh, also, they were looking to pull students from different types of programs, specifically nursing, theaters, engineering, and arts and sciences. So um, that was great to see. Um, despite Rutgers being number one on the previous list, there are only six students who are attending. Um, they do provide really great financial support for those who um, fall into the lowest bracket socioeconomic status, but they that middle range, they're not particularly generous, generous with merit aid. Um, so sometimes students find that they can actually find more affordable schools, either privately in state or out of state. Early decision is um, a type of application, of how students apply, which is binding. So if a student applies early decision, it means that if they are accepted, they are attending. And they can only apply early decision to one school at a time. Um, so it's a, um, it's a way for students to demonstrate that they're committed to that school. And in some cases, the yield of acceptances is higher when based on early decision applications versus regular decision applications. This year we had 117 early decision applications. 12 of those were what we call ED2. So there is a second round of early decision after January and after those um, early decision one results come out where st if a student had a denial from an early decision one application, they can or anyone else can apply ED2 to a school in that second window. Um, those 12 students who applied ED2 were a denial from an ED1. Um, this is the highest percent that we've seen. It's 39% of our college going cohort. I'm really upset that Mr. Colon is no longer on the board because this was his favorite slide and something he really pushed for. So I'm gonna personally call him and tell him this number. Um, but it's, it's gone up. Last year it was 36% and the year before 35%. We had 69 acceptances overall, which yields an acceptance rate of 59% of our, for our ED applicants. Um, it's a lot higher than the acceptance rate for these colleges that they're going to overall. 
um, the admit rate nationally for ED can sometimes be 10 to 20 percent. Um, you know, some schools don't offer it, and it's really a personal decision. So a lot of times we'll hear students, well, where are you applying ED, or, or should I apply ED? And it's something that we really work with each student at the individual level to determine if it's appropriate. Um, you're committing to going before you see a financial aid package, and for some of our students, that's not an option. And so we really want students to be strategic in how they use this and making sure it's, it's right for them. Um, and, and in some cases, it's an advantage, and we make sure that they have all the data they need to make the best decision for them. For some schools, it's more important than others. And what we're finding is that the mo more selective schools are using ED to fill their class and shape their class the, with the students they want. Um, so they're filling institutional needs. They're bringing in underrepresented students, like minority students, Pell eligible or low income students, first generation students, students from rural or more urban areas, um, athletes. You know, they're, they're trying to shape their class with the kids that they're looking to bring in, and this is the way to capture them. And they're also able to bring them in and um, evaluate their financial aid package at that first round as well. First generation is defined as students whose parents have not earned a four-year degree either in the United States or abroad. Uh, this is something that is self-reported. We have students indicate this in two different places. And um, the number of our graduating class was 45, so about 15%. And all but one of those students did submit an application to college with ni over 97% pursuing um, higher education. Over 80% are gonna be attending a four-year school. Um, we have in Summit a really strong college going culture as you can see from this presentation. And so these students, while they might not have um, the experience from their parents or the conversations at home all the time talking about that experience, they're exposed to it here. We also have um, wonderful partnerships with organizations in the community like PEP, like Destination College, who do a lot of great work to support these students and um, help them access higher education. And um, we're really proud of the work that we're able to do and increase um, not only their exposure and their applications, but also um, their success in attending a four-year school. Our low-income students are those who qualify for free or reduced lunch, and this is a statistic that we're able to pull from Genesis. This number is also 45. It does not mean that they are the same 45 students. However, um, there is traditionally overlap. Uh, 84, a little over 84% are pursuing higher education. Um, 38 of those 45 are pr pursuing traditional post-secondary ed. Um, this is up, last year was 80%, the year before was 75%, and these fall well above the national averages for this uh, population. Again, we're always looking to increase the, the, the statistics for this students. New Jersey especially is investing a lot in this population, as well as some other um, private schools who are providing um, packages that are grants and scholarships as opposed to loans to make college more affordable um, beyond just kind of that federal level. Um, there are some highly selective schools that are, are able to offer full tuition. We've had students who have been able to attend schools like BC, BU, Lehigh, Syracuse um, on full grant and scholarship money who otherwise would not have been able to access those schools. All right, where are we going? So our students, um, the South, uh, no, the Mid-Atlantic obviously is getting the most with almost half. Um, but then that South and Midwest are next and you can thank Wake Forest and Ohio, as I mentioned before, for that. Our students are going across 31 states plus Washington, D.C. They're going to Canada and the U.K. We have just over 50 who are staying in, in state and that's about 20%, which is consistent. The states that are getting the highest number of our students are Pennsylvania, um, then New York, Ohio, uh, Florida, and North Carolina are tied, and then Virginia. Just some overall statistics. This kind of encompasses a lot of what we've been talking about. Um, there's some fluctuation with class size. Obviously, we're starting to creep up a little bit again, and over the next couple years, you'll kind of see that number creeping. Um, the GPA went up over that 3.8 for the first time in terms of how this data has been reported. SAT scores remain similar. Um, the dip in the ACT, uh, what we see is 
kind of correlates to we have a higher percentage of students who submitted an application applying test optionally, which means they did not submit test scores. And then um, Allison did some further digging, uh, Ms. Grill did some further digging, and, and also saw that students who tend to take it in their senior year for the first time, the ACT, because maybe they decided to put a school on the list that requires test scores, or um, they might need it for merit aid or at a certain school or something, um, they're, they tend not to do as well as those students who might prep and take it in their end of sophomore or junior year. In general, our scores, our students do well. Our students have access to test prep and resources. Um, they're prepared with the curriculum that they're taking in school. Uh, one thing to note is that the SAT switched this spring to a digital format. Our students were able to take the PSAT in that digital format last fall. They will take it again as 10th and 11th graders this fall. So it'll be interesting to see how um, that shift in the online um, administration might impact scores. And not to be outdone, the ACT is also changing how they administer their test to compete. So, um, you know, it's all reflective in terms of, of what type of test that cohort of students is taking. Um, This, is, this kind of encompasses everything that we've really talked about. Uh, the, most of our students are continuing to pursue those four-year colleges versus two-year. And um, what we're really proud of is kind of also that increase in our low-income and first-gen college-going students. The ED numbers are, again, the highest that we've seen. Um, and then to talk about some of the shifts that we're seeing in college admissions. there's. Last year, the big conversation at this presentation was the recent um, decision with SCOTUS in terms of, of not considering race in admissions. Um, so that still exists, and what we're finding with that is that colleges are being really intentional about how to still shape their class and bring in students um, in different ways. And one way that we're seeing them do that is adding more specific and unique supplemental essays to try and capture students. It was never about checking a box. It was always about lived experiences. And so there are ways that they can still um, identify that from students. Uh, we've definitely seen surges in applications. And this is nationwide. This is not a summit, a summit thing. Um, and as a result of that, we are experiencing, our students are experiencing more deferrals and more wait lists at more competitive institutions. Um, and so our work and our job is to help students create balanced lists to make sure that um, they have options and, and will have you know, choices at the end of it. And, it. and as a result, it's more important than ever to have that conversation about creating the balanced list and being intentional about it. Test optional is, is still here. Um, it was here pre-COVID. It surged during COVID because of access to testing. Um, there are definitely some schools who were reverting back, um, schools like MIT. Johns Hopkins was just in the media this week. Um, a lot of what we're finding for those schools is sometimes they're major specific that they're requiring test scores for. They're more maybe STEM-based schools or focused schools. Um, we still have about half of our class who applies to at least one school test optionally, so our students are still using it. They're being intentional about it. Not submitting a test score um, does not mean that, that that category is just taken away. It just means that schools are putting more weight on the other parts of the application, really specifically your transcript and your performance in the curriculum that they're taking here. Um, what we're also seeing is more students and colleges offering these alternate entry pathways. So for example, when students apply to college, they have an option to pick, will you, will you, are you willing to be considered for a spring admit? Are you willing to be considered for a satellite campus? For example, at like Penn State, a lot of our students are, are afraid or hesitant to maybe check those boxes. And what we always say is put yourself in every every pile that you can because you at the end of the day you might want that detour to get to where you really want to be and so some schools are providing more opportunities to get to that finish line where you want but maybe with that detour um, by starting in the spring students transfer out in the fall so they need to fill those seats and so they they'll offer you a seat in the spring they might offer you a seat at a satellite or in a broad campus and then have you start on campus in spring um, so we're educating students when they have schools on their list that offer these programs on what it means if they do check that box. It doesn't mean you're committing to it. It's not a binding thing. It also doesn't mean that you're lessening your chances of being admitted for a traditional fall admit. Um, it's just another option to get to where you want to be. 
Um, and then to end, here, I know it's small. <laughs> we have to fit them all. This is a good problem, right? Um, so this is where everybody's going. Any, st any school that has an asterisk next to it indicates that more, um, more than one student is attending that school. And we're really proud of this class and their outcomes and, and just kind of the work that they do to get to where we think they're going to be successful. That's it. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Thank you. So um, back in the day, they used to publish um, a list called, I think it was Barron's Most Competitive, where schools were categorized. So there were Ivy League schools, and then there were categories of these other tiers. And that list has since um, been discontinued because it's, it, it was inconsistent data, what was being pulled, what was being used. Um, so wh what we're seeing in terms of, so I can tell you specifically, we had six Ivy League acceptances for this year and matriculations, um, three at Dartmouth, two at Penn, and one at Yale. Um, so I think it, it varies year to year. Our, some, of, some of our, those students who are going to the Ivy Leagues are recruited athletes. Um, and we, our students are definitely exploring highly competitive schools. Our students are very talented in many different ways and they are looking at that. Um, those small liberal arts schools, those, those public ivies, um, those Notre Dames and things. So we're, you are definitely seeing that. What we're also seeing um, is that some of those schools that are really attractive, like UNC for example, those, even those out-of-state publics are squeezing the out-of-state applicants. So there, there's legislature happening in those states that's requiring a certain percentage to be filled by in-state students, which is squeezing out our out-of-state students. So those competitive schools are even becoming more competitive. What we have in Naviance, which is our system that we kind of track this data that students materials are submitted from the high school is there's a full breakdown of every school of how many applications are submitted, how many acceptances for each year. And that data is also what we use and what parents and families use um, to help determine best fit for school and to help identify. So if there's a specific data point you'd be interested in for a certain school, I'd be happy to share that with you. Anything else? Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Laura and Crystal. Very well done. Nice job. presence announcements. Um, first, thank you to Laura Kaplan and Allison Grill for that amazing presentation. And we are excited and very inspired by the many options that our students have and how successful they have been each year, especially with early decision. Very nice job. Um, also, appreciate the fact that you said um, students um, considering having a balanced list and helping them, sort of guiding them and uh, navigating that path of there are thousands of colleges. So creating a balance list is something that is possible for each and every student, instead of focusing narrowly on schools that you might know of or that might have that brand name that a lot of people are attracted to. So I'm glad to see that that's part of the guidance that they're getting. So thank you again. Uh, I would like to say that this summer there have been many projects, part of our investing in our future, that have taken place and are near completion. So as students and families return to schools this September, we are excited and thrilled to see that our students will have the opportunity uh, to really um, embark in some new and renovated spaces that we think um, will make their experience so much better moving forward in the future. So we are thankful for the work that has been done in the last summer months, and we look forward to the work that will continue to be done to make our district strong um, and allow our students to have the best educational opportunities. I would also like to thank 
all of our employees that work in the summer. So the 11th and 12 month employees that do um, actually a lot of work that sometimes is not seen, uh, just because oftentimes people figure schools are shut down in the summer. Uh, the reality is that those folks work very hard preparing for the upcoming school year. And we like to give credit to all members of the Summit dis School District who have had to dedicate time this um, summer to commit to opening for the fall and having us prepared and ready to invite students and families back. And lastly, I would like to say, for those of you who are still on summer vacation, continue to enjoy that. These are the last few days of summer. August is a short month in reality, so please take time to spend with your families and we look forward to welcoming you all back in early September and we are very excited about the upcoming school year. The board just finished a retreat with the cabinet. We are excited about the upcoming year's goals and the continued good work that we are going to do. So I would encourage all of you to really enjoy it. We're gonna have a great school year um, and we hope you are all refreshed, refu refueled and we look forward to seeing your students in early September. So thank you and I will pass it on to Superintendent Huff for his report. Thank you, President uh, Walida, Justice. I um, disagree that I always say summer was over about a month ago for us, so, but we're, we are excited for the start of the school year. As you know, we like to recognize and welcome our new hires. We've had a lot of new hires since our last meeting in June, but I'm specifically going to recognize the ones that were able to attend tonight. So when I call your name, please stand up so the board can recognize you. Deanna Nelson, physical education teacher, Jefferson Elementary School. Lindsay Allen, special education teacher, Lincoln Hubbard Elementary School. <laughs> Thomas Dubillis, math teacher, Lawton C. Johnson. <laughs> and Christine and Carcione, school counselor, Summit High School. <laughs> Congratulations, we are very happy you're joining our team and we look forward to your contributions. And we will take a motion to approve. At this time, we're going to ask for a motion to approve the new hires. However, everybody, please note that the last hire, Gabriela Cunha, is being removed. So that would be a motion to approve everyone from uh, Mr. Margolis through Ms. Richardson, please. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? On the roll call, we have Ms. Stanton. Yes. Mr. Mahecha? Yes. Ms. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Cho? Yes. Vice President Cohn? Yes. President Justice? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Congratulations. And I would certainly be remiss if I did not uh, call out our two new directors. We typically have a reception when we hire uh, administrative officials. Uh, we were going to do that now, but we have a lot of construction in the building and it wasn't really a good time to do it. We're going to do it in September, but since our board approved here today, Ms. Heather Rocco, Director of Special Services. I'm sorry, I got Director of Curriculum and Instruction. I was looking at Greg already. <laughs> and Greg Margolis, Director of Special Services. It's not the first or the last time I'll misspeak. Okay, the rest of my report you're going to hear is going to be a lot of the same information that President Justice shared because it's worth repeating. Good evening, it's certainly been a busy summer. We're so excited to welcome our students and staff back for an outstanding and successful 24-25 school year. We are making tremendous progress with our Investing in Our Future initiative. Our high school construction project is in the Media Center is beginning to take shape, and we are on schedule for this project to be completed in April of 2025. The high school lower field project is completed, and our fall athletes and band are already putting it to good use. It's a beautiful facility. We're very pleased to be able to offer that to our students. Our construction project here at the middle school is almost completed. Some of the new spaces, including the cafeteria, may not be ready for the first day of school. We'll know much more next week. Principal Saferni is ready with contingency plans if needed. If alternate plans are needed, Principal Saferni will communicate with all his family sometime next week prior to the start of the school year. We have many students and families who are part of the Summit Public School football program, and they are all well aware that Anderson Fieldhouse recently flooded and displaced our teams. I'm happy to report that we responded quickly by securing a contractor to replace the roof, not repair it. This work has already begun, and we should have a watertight roof by the middle of next week. The entire roof project can be expected to be done in maybe two weeks. 
about two weeks. I praise Coach Kostobos and his team of coaches as well as our, our student athletes for not letting this unexpected inconvenience get in the way of their practices. This is another example of how Summit Public School community comes together to solve problems and overcome adversity. I've heard a couple of discussions the um, last few days about why are we replacing the roof now if we're just going to renovate the whole thing. Um, we're still on schedule to go out to bid for the project sometime in October with hopefully a start date for construction this winter, January or February. And the roof that we're putting on now is the roof that we were going to put on anyway. So it's not a waste of our funds and it will allow us to get our team back in for one more season, which is the goal. Every summer, our custodial and maintenance departments work extremely hard to clean our schools and get them ready for our students and staff to start the new school year. I want to extend a heartfelt thank you to all of our custodians and maintenance staff for their tireless efforts. They are all very much appreciated. Without them, we would not be able to provide our students with the excellent education that is expected in Summit Public Schools. I would also like to thank our administrators and our secretarial staff. The summer work that is required to successfully open a new school year is challenging. Making schedules, hiring new staff, writing curriculum, and planning professional development opportunities are just a few of the things that happen behind the scenes to get ready for a new school year. I thank all of our administrators and secretarial staff for their hard work and dedication to this district. We are excited to welcome all of our teachers and staff back for the 24-25 school year. We are gathering for a breakfast and opening activities next Wednesday, August 28. Our teachers will spend next Wednesday and next Thursday getting the classrooms ready and participating in professional development in preparation for welcoming our students on Tuesday, September 3rd. I hope everyone can enjoy the final days of summer with family and friends and be ready to start the school year off refreshed. And that concludes my report. We're just going to recess for a minute or two, so anyone who does not want to stay for the rest of the board's business, feel free to get up and leave. <laughs> Ms. Kaplan asked permission. for approval of items B C. C. May I have a motion? Ms. Stanton? Yes. Mr. Maecha? Yes. Ms. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Cho? Yes. Vice President Cohn? Yes. President Justice? Yes. Motion carries. Since we are still on summer break, we do not have a student board representative report. So we'll move to additions and revisions to the agenda. Yes, thank you, uh, President Justice. There uh, is, are some additions this evening on an addendum. Under personnel, there are four items. Triple E, approval of Christina Sarah to work an additional 20 hours curriculum writing LLD concepts of Algebra 1. Triple F, approval of Chelsea Barreto to work up to 15 hours curriculum writing environmental ecosystem and environmental population dynamics. Triple G, approval of Nicole Fotades to work up to 20 hours curriculum writing, honors anatomy and physiology. And Triple H, approval of Christine Murray, long-term inclusion aid substitute. And uh, when we vote on personnel, please consider approving those four items as well. Thank you. And at this time, we'll move into our committee reports. And we will start with education and student activities services. 
Education and Student Activities Committee, Services Committee met on August 15, 2024 for a total of 43 minutes. Members in attendance were myself, board members Eileen Kelly and Walida Justice, cabinet members Superintendent Scott Huff, Director of Curriculum Instruction Heather Rocco, and Student Personnel Services Dr. Crystal Marr. Much of what I'm going to cover has been discussed in the lovely presentations we had, but bear with me. Um, the first topic we discussed was the WIDA presentation that you heard from Dr. Crystal Marr today. The WIDA presentation is administered to students in kindergarten through 12th grade who have been identified as English language learners annually. The district must present the results of this assessment within 60 days of receipt. The assessment use, utilizes a one to six scale, one to two for entering, emerging, three to four for de developing, expanding, and five to six for bridging and reteaching. The state requires a score of 4.5 to exit this program, as well as additional performance feedback from teachers prior to students exiting. Upon exiting, students are continually monitored for at least two years to ensure that their language acquisition is met and that any need for early intervention is caught. As of this year's WIDA results, 28 students have, which is 16% of students enrolled in the program, have exited for the 23-24 school year. For context, there are roughly 170 students enrolled in the program, barely split evenly between elementary and secondary grade levels. The second thing we discussed was also a presentation by Laura Kaplan tonight, the NJGPA. The New Jersey Graduation Proficiency Assessment is required to be taken by all 11th graders in their spring semester. If students do not present proficiency, they have a secondary pathway available for their senior year. Multiple pathways are available for students to be eligible for graduating, including enrollment in an academic course that meets required standards through a portfolio appeal submission. Current assessment results are typical of previous years. The third thing we discussed was the district working alongside Ms. Grimaldi and the high school personnel to offer two overnight out of country trips for the 24-25 school year. The first is a trip to Taiwan in the spring of 2025 for some Mandarin students. The second trip is to Prague and other European countries in the summer of 2025 for history education students studying World War II and the Holocaust. The third or fourth thing we discussed was the HIT grant, the High Impact Tutoring Grant. Funds were released by the state for additional tutoring support within districts. We applied for this grant and were awarded $154,000. As a result, the district has developed its own program where in-house staff and students who meet outlined program, excuse me, program criteria will participate. To be considered a high impact tutoring, each cohort will consist of no more than three students at a time for a teacher, meeting three times a week. The district will set this up and get it running ASAP and is applying for the available extension just released by the Department of Education. Additional funds are now available and the extension will allow us to utilize these funds by June 2025. The tutoring will be provided based directly on student deficit needs to impact those who need it the most. The fifth thing we discussed is new programming. There will be an ELA rollout for grades three through five. Washington and Lincoln Hubbard are piloting a new ELA core resource in grades one and two. For 24-25, it will be the second year of this program for last year's grade three students, this year's grade four students at Lincoln Hubbard, which will now be expanded to all other elementary schools in grades three through five. We are also piloting a special education inclusion program at Washington Elementary School where every gen ed classroom with special education children will have a special education teacher in the gen ed class to fully support a completely inclusive classroom. This pilot is a direct reflection of our goal to have fully inclusive classrooms district-wide. Additionally, we discussed the ERI program, which is the Emotional Regulation Impairment Program, which will roll out at Jefferson Elementary School for the 24-25 school year. This is a self-sustaining program with a minimum of two students enrolled annually. It provides our students in district resources rather than out of district, district and in the future, our hope is to provide this program for out of district schools who don't have a program in-house. Additionally, we discussed the PBSIS program. The PBSIS program, which is also known as Positive Behavior Support in Schools, is a grant Jefferson Elementary School's principal, Ms. Feria, applied for and was awarded. This three-year program will provide additional correct 
curriculum and support to provide positive discipline in the classroom. In year one, various training and planning for the 25-26 school year will take place. During year two, implementation will commence, and in year three, feedback and adjustments for the grant's final year will take place. Ms. Farias will share her findings and efforts, coordinating with other elementary school principals so that all schools can benefit from the grant. We then moved on to talk about our strategic plan. This year, the district will take a look at our vision, mission statement, facilities and security at both elementary and secondary levels to develop a strategic three to five year plan. During this process, we will explore a more expansive global planning outlook to cover the next three to five years that is inclusive of our board goals. Our action plan will be prepared for the 25-26 school year and the strategic planning outline will be added as our fourth goal for the 24-25 school year. Another thing that we discussed was presented tonight by Laura Kaplan, the annual college outcome report. This report shared post-secondary outcomes, statistics, geographic diversity of placement, trends and policy shifts, as well as details regarding early decision, first generation students, and low income students. This year's graduating class totaled 286 students, 94.1% or 269 students, of which are pursuing higher education. The recommendations for the board are approval of the high school trip to Taiwan in 2025, I'm sorry, spring 2025, to provide a fully immersive real life experience supporting the Mandarin language education, and approval for the high school trip to Prague in the summer of 2025 to reinforce history education of World War II and the Holocaust curric curriculum. Are there any questions or additions from the board? Okay, our next meeting is Thursday, September 5th at 12 p.m. Thank you, Ms. Stanton. And now we'll move on to the Operations Committee. The, operation, oops, the Operations Committee uh, did not meet in the month of August as the agenda was composed of items that are typically approved by the board without discussion, such as tuition agreements, acceptance of donations, and items such as payroll. But for um, the readout this month, I do want to update uh, um, the public on a few points. First, as a reminder, the administration members and board members on the committee are Derek Jess, Jan Cho, Kathy Sarno, Melanie Cohn, Scott Huff, and myself. Uh, a food service update, Pomptonian, the monthly P&L for June is at $89,260.21. For FY24, uh, year to date would be $191,444.76. The FY24 fiscal year is now closed and auditors began their remote audit work this week and will be on site beginning September 26. An update on investing in our future projects. At Brayton, all windows are now installed and the contractor is patching up some additional building concrete with the anticipated completion for September 1st. At the high school, the lower field is complete. The contractor is finishing, fen is finishing the fence and the field will be available for use as of September 1st. Landscaping will be completed in the future. At the Summit High School renovations and additions, um, addition the anticipated excuse me, completion of the addition is April 2025 and renovation of the drama and chorus room is expected to be completed by the end of September. At the middle school for renovations and additions, um, the anticipated completion of additions and renovations is this September. At the middle school, the HVAC system, a majority of the HVAC equipment has been installed. The contractor will continue to install equipment outside of the classrooms as well as test the system during the school year. And for Tatlock, the architects are finalizing the plans for an anticipated bid uh, this fall. Um, and lastly, at the middle school, the athletic field, um, the architects are finalizing their plans for an anticipated bid date for the fall of 2024 as well. There are no committee recommendations at this time. The next meeting will be scheduled for Tuesday, September, September 10th, excuse me. Thank you, Ms. Kelly, and we will move to the policy committee. Reading on behalf of the policy committee, as Jen isn't here today, uh, the policy committee met on Wednesday, August 14th for 33 minutes. Committee members in attendance were Scott Huff, Rob Gardella, Kathleen Murphy, Jen Irde, myself, and Carlos Mejecha. The policies we discussed with the key points noted are policy 0164.6. This is remote public board meetings during a declared emergency. This was a mandated policy that we are abolishing. Um, a key point to note here is that this policy allowed for public board meetings to be conducted remotely. The policy has expired, um, which 
the date, this expiration date has passed. The second policy is policy 2200, curriculum content. This also was mandated and had a revision. This policy has been revised to ensure that the language is cleaned up, eliminating outdated information, and now reflects New Jersey Student Learning Standards, NJSLS, instead of previous language related to New Jersey core curriculum content standards. Additionally, code citations were updated and the, remo the removal of listing referred standards occurred to allow for flexibility of standards to change without additional policy revisions. Third, we talked about policy and regulation 3160. This is a physical examination for teaching staff. This was mandated and is revised. The policy revision updates the testing requirements for tuberculosis for high-risk teaching staff. It also includes necessary language cleanup for consistency and code citation additions and updates. Reference was added to guidance to allow for flexibility for standards to change, again, without requiring policy revisions. Policy and regulation 4160, physical examination for support staff. This was a mandate revision. The policy revision updates the testing requirements for tuberculosis for high-risk support staff. It also includes necessary language cleanup for consistency and code citations, additions, and updates. Reference was added to guidance to allow for flexibility in the standards to change without, additional, without requiring additional policy revisions. We then discussed policy and regulation 8467, firearms and weapons. This was a mandated policy revision. The policy has been rewritten to align with the current language in the statute and administrative code regarding student possession and or use of firearms and weapons on school grounds. The final policy we discussed was policy 9181, volunteer athletic coaches and co-curricular activity advisors assistance. This was a revision. The policy revision updates the testing requirements for tuberculosis for volunteer athletic coaches and co-curricular activity advisors and assistants. It also includes necessary language cleanup for consistency. Committee recommendations for the board are first reading of policy 0164.6, policy 2200, policy and regulation 3160, policy and regulation 4160, policy and regulation 8476, and policy 9181. Does anyone have any questions about that? Okay, and our next meeting is Wednesday, September 4th at 9.30. Thank you, Ms. Stanton. And our next committee is communications. The communications committee met on um, August 13th at 12 noon. We met for 36 minutes. In attendance was myself, Jan Cho, Carlos Mahecha, Superintendent Scott Huff, Cabinet members Lorene Dickinson and Doug Orr. Um, the committee began by looking at the communication survey results. Um, we reviewed the reports, which showed consistent results from previous years with an overall improvement in ratings. The discussion centered on parent feedback about reduced communications from teachers in middle and high school. The committee explored the balance between student independence and ensuring parents stay informed. The importance of educating parents on the Genesis system and clear communication guidelines for teachers was emphasized. Superintendent Huff confirmed that guidelines for teacher parent communications are included in the principal's handbooks and he noted that some teachers go above and beyond these guidelines and that the conversation around communication has changed as technology use has advanced. The committee discussed providing additional tools to guide teacher parent communications and outreach um, that the district offers to our Spanish speaking families. Superintendent Huff noted that this is the third year of gathering the communication survey data and the district uses it to make informed decisions. Laureen will meet with each of the principals to review the survey results and consider any potential changes to communication practices. Um, the survey reports are posted on the district website for the community to review. Back to school letters. For teachers, the back to school letter um, will include a schedule for the first two days back, which include time for professional development and classroom preparation. Information on new director level, level hires and, um, and investing in our future construction update. 
parents will receive back to school letters from both the superintendent and the principal of their child's school. Principals back to school letters will be sent out approximately one week before school starts and includes teacher assignments. Superintendent Huff noted that the superintendent's letter will include details on the investing in our future construction and any potential impacts that students might face. The goal is to complete the middle school lunchroom by the first day students return, as was reported in Superintendent Huff's um, notice at the top of this meeting. But there is a possibility that work will continue into the first week of school. The district has a contingency plan if that occurs. The HVAC system in the middle school will be finished by next spring. In discussing the communication outreach um, to the um, wider community, Superintendent Huff referenced a recent article that was published in Tap Into on August 12, 2024, regarding um, the investing in our future construction update. Finally, we discussed community feedback. Uh, the committee discussed some complaints from local residents related to middle school construction. The superintendent mentioned that the district had reached out to nearby homes and asked contractors not to park on Oak Street as it does contribute to congestion. Um, the next meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, September 3rd at 12 noon. Um, from our committee members, was there anything that I missed? Okay, thank you. And are there any questions from the rest of the board? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. The Negotiations Committee has been meeting with the SSA this summer. We have had two meetings, and we will have a third meeting coming up, and those negotiations have been going well, and we hope to have that settled um, within the next few months. So we look forward to continuing negotiations with the SSA. At this time, does anyone have liaison reports? You can tell it's summer, so we will move along. We are on to public comment. Good evening, everybody. Anyone wishing to speak shall first seek recognition by the presiding officer. We ask that you please come to the microphone and state your name and address in a clear, audible tone for the record. Please direct all your comments to the board president and not an individual member of the board. And please remember to conduct yourself with decorum and respect when speaking and addressing the board. Unless additional time is granted by the board president, please keep your comments to three minutes or less. In addition, please note that this portion of the meeting is for public comment and not meant to be a back and forth. Board members and administration will not respond to questions or comments at this time. However, information will be provided by the appropriate individual as soon as possible. We'll begin with public comments or items on the agenda. Thank you, my name, is, my name is Catherine Marks. I'm at 9 Pearl Street. I have two kids at the high school, a sophomore and a senior. And I had a few questions and want to share com some concerns around um, the field house. So first of all, I was not aware of um, how bad the condition of the field, uh, you know, how bad the condition of the field house was until recently when everything had to be moved out of the field house, um, the kids were helping and so forth. Um, but from what I've learned since is that it's not or was not an unknown problem, right? So apparently for years the field house has been in a pretty bad condition with mold, water leaking and so forth. So my first question is, and I understand you might not be able to answer my questions tonight, but hopefully at some point, why are we only now starting with repairs? Apparently the roof was super necessary right now, but why are we only um, calling for a bid um, for the rest of the repairs? Then what exactly is the plan? It sounds like you already have a plan as you referred to the roof that we had planned to, you know, that was planned for will now be <coughs> put on the, on the current um, structure, right? So there must be a plan. Where can I learn about the plan? What is planned? Um, then my concern is about what are you going to do about the mold that's already existing, right? Replacing the roof does not deal with the mold, and that's my biggest concern, right? Um, mold probably has been there for a really long time. It's not always visible at first. If it's really bad now, it's probably been bad for several years. Um, my understanding is also that in New Jersey, there's no regulation around 
um, how to deal with mold, how to, um, how to remediate it um, according to a conversation that we had with the health department. So how can you ensure that our kids are moving back into a field house that is safe to use? That's, that's my question, my comment. Are there any responses? We, we appreciate your questions and appreciate you sharing your feedback and we can get answers to those questions for you. And how do I get the answers and where can I follow what's happening? What's, where can I um, get in, insights into what is planned? How, do we, how are we able to keep up with what's happening? I'd be happy to have a conversation with you over the phone over the next couple of days or even if you stay after the meeting, I can have a conversation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. My name is Ed Fitzpatrick. I live on New England Avenue, but I spend a ton of time down at Tatlock following the football team, lacrosse team. I also walk the track an awful lot. Um, my concern is, uh, again, in the field house. Um, I understand you can't answer the questions now, but um, you were stating earlier, I think, Superintendent, that the roof that is being put on now is the roof that would have been put on sooner. I just want to make sure I was walking past there today and uh, I know I'm gonna get a little technical, but I wanna make sure before it's completed that's done right. Over, especially by the bathroom doors, where they've lifted up, I'm gonna say the sheeting, the aluminum sheeting that, you can see the rotting wood. The rotting wood is flaking down um, in front of the bath, and I wanna make sure that if we're saying it's a new roof, it is a brand new roof, and because it looks like they're getting ready to just cover some of it with tar paper. I'm not an expert, but I do wanna make sure that they're gonna be spending all this money that it's being done right and that we don't have to go back when we do the rest of the renovations, repairs, whatever we're gonna do, that it's done again. Um, uh, again, a little bit technical, is that there are no gutters around that entire building. Um, and even in the summer, especially again, the corner by the bathrooms, water just drips and drips and drips. I was walking down there um, earlier, probably late winter, very early spring after a very cold spell. And I was walking on the mechanic, the asphalt by the door going into the zoo room. I thought it was just water. It was black ice. I fell on my butt almost, you know. Again, I want to make sure that if this is the roof, the permanent roof, that it is done right and not just a slapped up job. Um, as Catherine was stating before, um, what precautions or what um, what are we doing to make sure that before we send the, the players and the coaches back into the field house that it's been necessarily inspected, cleaned, disinfected, um, the electricity is working. I, I, again, my understanding, wasn't didn't, didn't experience it firsthand, is that um, there's no way that water could not have gone into the electrical system in the room itself, just based on the amount of water and that. But uh, again, I'm not, I just want to make sure that when we send our students and the coaches back, we're sending them into a safe and uh, building which is not going to also detriment their health. Uh, Sharon Trujillo, 13 Hughes Place. Um, also regarding the field house, I have an eighth grade son um, who is in the football program at the youth level and I have a junior who's uh, in the football program at the varsity level. So my biggest concern is mold. Uh, I don't know what the situation looks like in there. Um, from my understanding, the roof has been an issue um, with the building for um, many years, longer than I've probably lived in Summit. Um, so I guess my concern slash question that you guys can make note of and let me know at a later time is, for example, the enormous amount of rain that we had on Sunday. Um, what was happening, like if the roof was damaged and not replaced at that point, all that water coming into that building, 
where does it go? What happens to the property in there? What standing water? I mean, I know my driveway, I had about four inches of water. Um, so I'm just, my concern is the condition of the field house. Um, a new roof sounds great, but if you're putting a new roof on something that's, you know, not sound um, structurally, or um, if there's something in the air, um, my son does spend a lot of time in there and has for a couple of years, so I just, that is a concern of mine. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Thank you. Public comment on items not on the agenda. I have a motion to close public comment. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Pay attention. Motion passed. Our next item is public hearing on amendment to the superintendent of schools contract of employment. May I have a motion? Discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion carried. Thank you. And now on to the approval of board minutes. May I have a motion? So moved. We stand with the motion of Mr. Cho second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed? Any abstention? Motion carries. And next is curriculum, instruction, and program. It's the A through I. May I have a motion? Can I just ask a quick question in this section? Sorry. Uh, um, motion, we need a motion first oh, and then a second for discussion. Please. So moved. <laughs> second. <laughs> oh, you're jumping in. Any discussion? <laughs> yes, apparently. Um, just on item B, comprehensive equity plan statement of assurance. Can you just remind me what, what that is and what it's intended to do? Comprehensive equity plan is a three-year plan that every district is uh, expected to develop. It's the same for every district, basically, based on uh, policies around equity and uh, the life of uh, operations in our school district. They've been telling us a new template's coming out for a number of years hasn't so they're allowing us to extend like every other school so we're just giving a statement of assurance that we're aware and our existing plans needs in place okay and so sorry what are the outcomes for that plan I'm just not as familiar with it it's a compliance factor for making sure that we have the proper policies in place for equity and uh, fairness around the operations of our school district okay okay thanks for that we have a discussion Ms. Stan yes Mr. Maecha yeah Ms. Kelly yes Mr. Cho Yes. Vice President Cohen? Yes. President Justice? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, next item is finance. Items A through... Double L. Double L. Thank you. Bless, Bless you. you. Bless you. May I have a motion? I have a motion from the stand. May I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Ms. Stanton? Yes. Mr. Maecha? Yes. Ms. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Cho? Yes. Vice President Cohn? Yes. President Justice? Yes. Motion carries. The next item is school board operation. Items A through D. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? I, I just have a question in this section as well. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Um, so for, for the emergency purchase of the roof replacement, can you just remind me as well, so we're replacing the roof, but the field house will be replaced this spring? Correct. The field house is part of the investing in our future, and it was always planned to be renovated from the roof all the way down through the interior of the building. Unfortunately, with the, well, fortunately or unfortunately, with the rain that we've had, it necessitated us to take 
uh, quick action and we were approved by the county to replace the roof through an emergency purchase in accordance with 18A, 18A, 18A-7, which allows us to, um, when it affects the health and welfare of a student, we are allowed to do a project without having to go out to public bid. And so we're gonna replace the roof now. We have a plan from the architect uh, which we need to submit to the city in order to get the permit to replace the roof. But we're going to replace the roof. It'll be a brand new roof. And then, uh, the, as Superintendent Huff said earlier, the plans will be finished for the remainder of the renovation. Uh, we'll go out to bid, hopefully start the uh, award it in December, start construction in the early part of 2025 for the renovation of the rest of the building. But the roof will remain the same. The only difference is we may have some rooftop units which may have to have some perforations through the roof to connect heating to the inside of the building. following normal process. We're just having Correct. exception because of the emergency situation. Correct. Thank you for backup. You're welcome. Any other discussion? Ms. Stanton? Yes. Mr. Maecha? Yeah. Ms. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Cho? Yes. Ms. Cohn? Yes. Ms. Justice? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, next item is personnel. And items A through... Triple H. Triple H. H. Triple H. Triple H. Sorry. That's and, okay. Um, may I have a motion? We have a second? Second. Any discussion? Ms. Stanton? Yes. Mr. Maecha? Yes. Ms. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Cho? Yes. Vice President Cohn? Yes. President Justice? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, next item is policy and regulations. May I have a motion? So moved. Any discussion? Ms. Stanton? Yes. Mr. Maecha? Yes. Ms. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Cho? Yes. Vice President Cohn? Yes. President Justice? Yes. Motion carries. And we may adjourn this meeting. May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstention? The motion carries. Thank you.